Program Manager, Racial Relations and Advocacy, Center Unified School District. We have an exhibit that we're going to introduce you to, uh, The Untold Story of the Aboriginals of North America and Abroad. Each month we do a focus exhibit throughout the year. Our school district is second largest school district uh, uh, in the state and eighth in the nation. We have approximately 135,000 students and about 12,000 adults. We'd like to begin this exhibit by going to our common core standards. And the standard that we're focusing on is on social studies history and it's standard nine to introduce multidisciplinary uh, content. This invites the student to have a number of resources. Historically in our district, we have focused on the Native American population uh, and amongst that population have been uh, the Asians who came uh, some thousands of years ago. Uh, this story begins with the people that they met when they came that we are now identifying as the Aboriginal population. The story will involve uh, the meeting of those two cultures, the interaction of those two cultures, and the resulting history of those cultures. To assist us, we have uh, Najim would like you to come uh, and join us. Najim uh, is a past uh, employee of the San Unified School District, and Najim actually is our research specialist uh, on the exhibit, and he is actually going to lead the conversation on the exhibit. From time to time, I'll be invited uh, to make a comment or two uh, upon his request. Najim, uh, can you begin this journey for us? Okay, let's do it. <coughs> All right, so first we're going to start off with some core understandings of what we're going to get into here. First, we need to understand what is primary resource documents. <clears throat> In the study of history as an academic discipline, a primary source, also original source for evidence, is an artifact, a document, diary, manuscript, autobiography, a recording, or any other source of information that was created at the time under study. You know, the definition goes further, but that's the general concept of what the type of information we're about to engage in here. Um, here I have some, a couple of books. This is uh, America, the New World, and uh, by uh, Norvis uh, Montanus. And this book here is uh, almost a thousand pages. It gives full pictures and a thorough description of what the early uh, white uh, so-called settlers saw and the people they saw when they first pulled up to the Americas. This book was written in the 1600s. This is definitely a primary resource document. This is a 1828 Noel Webster's English Dictionary. One might say, what's the point of having this up here? Well, there's two reasons. One reason being they at this time, slaves still couldn't read. Yes, slaves, some slaves could read, but during slavery, slaves were prohibited by, to read because of, in the time of slavery, every book that was out, every piece of information and document, this was the era of primary research uh, documents. So they could not read these things because these things would reveal a lot of truth that they were uh, not privy to and would just really pull the wool so in this dictionary here, you're going to get a lot of authentic definitions of words. Uh, you'll get some etymology of where things come from in the, English, in the English language. And in the dictionaries today, it's really watered down, so you're not going to get any of these things in the modern day dictionaries. So this is definitely a good source for the English language definition of words. We're going to come back to this part of the exhibit because this is not the main focus, but this is just a a uh, small intro to the purpose. But we're gonna go ahead and move on to here. This is the debunked section, okay? We're gonna be debunking some uh, fabricated, long-told lies that we've all been fed, which is the famous story of Roots, and written by this man who we all know as Alex Haley. Now, <clears throat> Alex Haley, as it reads here, author of the book Roots, was permitted to settle out of court for $650,000, having admitted that he copied large passages of his novel from a book called The African by Harold Corlander, which is him. And this is the book, The African. Now, in this book, as this man wrote, it's 100% fiction. So Alex Haley was used 
to propagate this uh, fantasized lie about the original story of the blacks in America to uh, add to the misnomer of the multiple identities through words that they keep giving the African American, so called African American uh, in America. And we'll get back to that word as well, African American, at the end of the exhibit. So, this is a very important piece of information here because once you understand how this is false and this is nothing but fiction, it's plagiarism at its highest, okay? The man who they praise and, and uh, have you watch a thousand different versions of Roots. Once you debunk this in your mind, then you can start to unravel things and get ready for what's coming next. So we move here. Here we have a man called Paul Cuffey. And Paul Cuffey is responsible for something that we know as the American Colonization Society. And this in short, but we will read a passage here, is when they shipped 12,000 plus Aboriginal Blacks from America, Indigenous Americans, to the west coast of Africa, which created Sierra Leone and Liberia. So this is definitely some untold history here. Uh, we're taught that the transatlantic slave trade is only in one direction, that is from Africa to America, when in reality, it's the opposite way. But there is some truth to it, and we'll touch on these facts right now. All right, so between 1676 and the 1700s, when slavery actually started, there were about 3,000 slaves, 3,327 to be exact. Okay, now by 1790, approximately 7,000. By 1810, it grew to 12,000. Pay attention to the numbers. By the 1860s, it boomed to 4 million. Now, in 1800 to 1866, Here's where, here, here's where the African slave trade comes in. Only 100,000 slaves were actually brought from Africa. Two thirds were male, one third were children and female. So the percentage is 22% children, 14% female. Now, the women when they came over here, okay, they had to acclimate. Because of the boat ride and because of the extreme conditions, uh, many of them were, were unable to bear children. They were uh, barren women, okay? Now, America is the only country that's known for uh, reproducing its own slaves, uh, homegrown slaves. So we know through the common stories of slavery that they had, you know, uh, houses where uh, they would you know, make the slaves uh, have intercourse to produce more children, separate the children from the parents, separate the fathers from the uh, mothers and the children, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is common knowledge amongst the uh, people who are familiar with slavery. So here, this is major because you can find these numbers online, and anything I'm saying, you can research it yourself. The purpose of this exhibit is not for me to do all the homework for you. I've done plenty of homework enough for you to get the wheels turning. Anything that I say, pause the video, hold me to it, Google it, search it, whatever you wanna do, but that's the purpose of this, is to provoke thought and to get you to do your own homework and verify everything that's being said here. So now we get back to Paul Cuffey, and as we move over here, uh, let me read a little bit from the top. It says, the American Colonization Society was an organization formed in 1816 with the purpose of transporting the Aborigines of America to settle on the west coast of Africa. During the decades, the U.S. transported more than 12,000 Aboriginal blacks to Africa, um, hence the African nation of Sierra Leone and Liberia was founded. The idea of moving the black Aborigines from America to Africa was always controversial, while to some supporters of the society it was considered a benevolent gesture, but most advocates of sending American Aborigines to Africa did do so with obviously racist motives. So John Henry, I mean uh, Henry Clay and John Randolph, these are people that were on the commission. The president of the commission was Bushrod Washington. This is the nephew of George Washington. Okay, so you see where he's coming from. 
here is a certificate a, uh, for when members, from when people became members of this specific society, they got a certificate of recognition, and this is what that looked like. So this is another screenshot or a uh, copy of uh, Paul Cuffey and his uh, recognition as a so-called man of color uh, being the forerunner to shipping out the mass numbers of the black aboriginals from America to Africa. As we move along here, now we're going to get into a bunch of photos that most of these photos come from the book that I just showed you in the very beginning of the exhibit by Arnaldus uh, or Montanus, excuse me, Arnaldus Montanus. Specifically this picture here, okay? We're seeing early pictures of, uh, early depictions of America and what they saw when they came here. Okay, you can see everybody in this picture, with the exception of a few, is black. Okay, we have down to here, we have this woman here, once again, early American drawings. This is before cameras, so all they can do is draw what they've seen. Once again, these are primary resource document pictures. Um, an emblem of America, of the black woman, okay, not an African. And let me, let me comment on this too. Unfortunately, black people have been tricked into restricting themselves to identifying only with the African continent as their original source of ancestry and uh, their, their beginnings. So, um, so that's a problem because everybody white doesn't say they're from England, okay? Mm -hmm. Everybody, everybody from France doesn't say they're from uh, uh, Ireland, so on and so forth. Everybody white doesn't limit themselves to being from Canada. So why do black people just keep saying, oh, I'm from Africa, my ancestors from Africa? This is because we've been force-fed these, these theories. This is not true. So like if we round up five different Asians, a Korean, a Japanese, a Chinese, a North Korean, a South Korean, uh, Hawaiian today, so on and so forth, we would not be able to tell the difference because for one, we're not Asian descent to maybe distinctly know the difference. For two, there generally is no difference. We line up a man from, Fran from France, Norway, Germany, okay, uh, Ireland, England, Poland, you wouldn't know the difference. Maybe some red hair here, maybe some blonde hair here, but you couldn't tell the difference. Only black people restrict themselves to one continent. So this, this is because of the brainwash. So this man here, <coughs> he, this, this man's name is, let's see, Walter Plecker, okay? He's responsible for what we know as what's called paper genocide of the Aboriginal Americans in North America. It says here that this man was responsible for the destruction of the records in 1913 uh, in all 50 states that showed how Native Americans were reclassified as black, Negro, or colored in the first U.S. Census in 1790. Plecker also threatened anyone who put Indian on their birth certificate. So this was a systematic process when they weaned out the aboriginals from the history books. The aboriginals of America are uh, <laughs> one of the most thoroughly um, swept under the rug uh, depictions of any continent. Usually most continents you can easily see the original people there. America has went out of its way to hide the true identity of the original people. Here, once again, primary source documents, we have a pictorial depiction next to definitions of different classifications of race. We have the European race, okay, they give the facial features, the skin color, the hair texture, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We have the Chinaman or the Asian, we have the African, and in the middle we have the American. And I don't know how, if you can see it, but uh, you can pull these things up. When you zoom in, you really can't tell the difference between an African and an American according to these, uh, these drawings here. Black is black. So this person doesn't look like the typical Indian that we see today. He doesn't have the uh, mongoloid features that were force fed as well, that all Native Americans have a mongoloid, straight hair, red skin type of uh, phenotypes. That's, that's not the case at all. 
So the early settlers, so-called settlers from Europe, they depicted the American as black. We're gonna move pretty swiftly through here. A lot of these things can be elaborated on more, but we're gonna just move through it because like I said, this is for you to do your homework on. Um, before I go any further, this is Montezuma, but properly pronounced Mutzekzuma, okay? You see he's black, okay? Uh, this is a depiction uh, of the West Indian scene, okay, in 1795, okay? You see here, once again, no slaves were the reason for the inhabitants of the Caribbean. The Caribbean always had inhabitants. There was never a population in the Americas that is 100% reliant on uh, the importation of African slaves. That is 100% false. There is no colony in the Americas that is started by slaves being imported from Africa or runaway slaves from plantations, once again, False stories of the Jamaican Caribbean history is that Jamaica was started by runaway Indians, freed slaves, and runaway slaves. That's another lie. Okay, here Carlos Marquez states the Negro feature frequently in the most remote traditions of some American pueblos. It is to this race, doubtlessly, belongs the most ancient skeletons, distinct from the red American race which have been found in various places from Bolivia to Mexico. It is likely that, we repeat, America was a Negro continent. 1858, 1930, that's when this man died, 1930. So, Carlos Marquez, look it up. Once again, we have James Hugo in the South, the physical characteristics of many Negro slaves bore witness to their Indian origin. We have extended uh, perspectives on the description of the people that came uh, to the Americas that were not indigenous, the Europeans, and what they saw, and this is just confirmation of what we've already just read now. They're all saying the same thing just from their own different experience. Um, this is the seal of the island of California, and this woman in this picture is Queen Calafia. And um, I know that you know a few things about her. Do you want to go ahead and share some things? Yeah, they depict her commonly uh, uh, as uh, uh, a black woman. Mm -hmm. And in the Mark Hopkins Hotel uh, in San Francisco, they have the Room of the Dawns. And they actually had a mayor uh, uh, that commissioned the artists of the day to portray the original aboriginal inhabitants of, of California and he portrayed them as aboriginal. Those murals are still there today. And so the state of California actually uh, uh, is the name from, they say the mythical queen, uh, we still have to do that research of Queen Calafia, always portrayed as aboriginal and black. And these women also, they protected California as an army of women. Is yes, correct? they were styled as a Amazon society of uh, mm -hmm. women uh, who uh, had women predominantly and the men were, uh, they found creative ways to remove the males from their society. Okay, so we got a quote here, Malcolm X, you and I are Aborigines. Real small, but once again, do your research. You can YouTube it, you can find the live speech where Malcolm X had the extended seven minute speech, I guess it was, or I forget well, exactly how long it is, but the point is you can find the speech where he mentions Aborigines, just type it in. Here we have a depiction of the King of Florida, and this is in the 19th century that this was drawn, uh, I guess it says here in this picture, uh, at Johnny Aborigine. Johnny Aborigine is a person who puts some very good informative pictures of the aboriginals in America with good commentary, good dates and times, books and references. Uh, so this picture is supposedly from the 1671 era of the King of Florida. Once again, black aboriginal. We have a picture of the Mohawk Indian man, okay? You see the features, okay? We have, uh, this is a depiction of people of Illinois, okay? Aboriginals in Illinois here. Uh, here, this is the king of California, crowning, uh, it says here, those so-called white settlers. I say so-called because the term settlers is a very um, 
Uh, it's a very watered down term for what they actually were. We, we can't play with this here. These people were no, nothing less than invaders. This was not their country. Uh, they came from their own homeland to another people's homeland and they systematically through treachery uh, took the land over through numerous ways of deception. So these people were not settlers because they were not welcome. Only people that are welcome to a place are considered settlers. When you're not welcome, when you're hostile with the people that are there, you're no longer a settler, you are combatant, you are invaders. So we have to stop making these words pretty because it wasn't a pretty situation. These are the aboriginals of Oakland, California. Uh, I don't have the, the written descriptions of these, but once again, also you can go on Pinterest and you can type in Black Aboriginals of America. Pinterest has countless pictures uh, with full captions on dates and times, people, tribes, the whole nine yards. And most, a lot of these pictures are from Pinterest also. So Pinterest is very, very informative, very helpful when it comes to uh, pulling out good authentic pictures of the black aboriginals in America. Here we have a picture of the aboriginals fighting back against the colonists, against the European invaders, and which we don't see much of. They like to glorify the black man in America being enslaved and hung, tortured, beat, dogged out, but they don't want to depict any other frame in history as if the black man was continuously defeated. No, there was constant rebellions, there was constant slave rebellions, there was constant Indian tribe rebellions. Uh, we'll, we're, as I move on, we're gonna get to what we call the five civilized tribes. And as I provoke thought with this next statement, this is uh, noteworthy. What makes them civilized? Are they civilized because they submitted to the will of the invaders? Because this is a term that's given to them by the invaders of America. So in other words, all the other tribes that did not make it to the civilized tribe count were considered hostile tribes. And the hostile tribes were doing no more than what any people in any country would do to foreign invaders, which was fight these people relentlessly to the last tooth. And that's their right, as is everybody else's right in their own homeland. <clears throat> So here, here comes the fun part now. Five dollar Indians of America. This is where it gets tricky and funny. Okay, now let's take it from the top here. We're gonna spend a little more time on this one than any other one because this is definitely worth uh, diving into pretty deep. All right, so it says here, um, the indigenous Indians or otherwise known as the Aborigines have since blamed the U.S. government for the mismanagement of a trust made in their name for well over 120 years, and now the U.S. government owes them tens of billions of dollars. Can we, can we shift over here? Hmm. Uh, it says, Black Indian Aborigines, was it because of the, the, okay. Black Indian Aborigines were supposed to benefit, but the government gave the land benefits and tax reliefs and other federal specialized benefits to white settlers who paid of the Citizenship Administrative Organization in order to become members in what is known as the five civilized tribes in Indian territory categories. Now, I'm gonna finish the rest of this because we have to go over this here. This cannot just be brushed over. So what's happening here is you're, you're getting now some good information, especially about to come next, about who these players are. This is Grover Cleveland. This was the president in this time and when everything took place. This is Henry L. Dawes, okay? He created the Dawes Commission, okay? Which, uh, and this is some pictures of this commission, okay? And this is how they systematically were able to take the land of the aboriginals through documents, through false census, and through false ethnic recognition. And this is why they're coined as the $5 Indians, and we're gonna to get to that next. So this era in time, this man, this Dawes Commission is monumental in the history of the aboriginals in America, because just like Plecker with the paper genocide, this was pretty much 
in the same frame as you see here, 1914, 1893 to 1914, is commissioned here by Kent Carter. Get this book, The Doss Commission, okay? Do your homework. So, let's get back to here. Um, okay, let's see. White settlers sought to reap the benefits of the Aborigines. In 1895, the white settlers were informed of what benefits they were entitled to. So they traveled to the Dawes Roll Commission, that's Dawes, to inquire about having their names enlisted on the roll cards as full-blooded or as freedmen Indians of American lands. In 1898, the Dawes Roll Commission acted as a census responsible for documenting records of one's ethnic background in order to determine one's association with the specific American Indian tribe. Now, that's everything I just said in a nutshell. And once again, if we really understand that when we see people who are European and they're claiming to be Indian today and they say, oh, my grandfather's Cherokee, my grandfather's Navajo or Mohawk, this is a blatant smack in the face because Either you're an Indian or you're not. Either you have the features or you don't. Either your bloodline is carried to, to today and that's who you still are or you're not. People can be bred out, a race can be bred out. So just because somebody's 65th great grandfather or something doesn't mean that you're gonna be that today because it just takes a couple of people mixing and matching and you're no longer who they were. So it doesn't take much to breed out a race of people. So you cannot just claim an identity without being that. But this is what they did. So it says, also it played an important role in determining which Indian tribes would get land allotments as well as other benefits in return for abolishing, here comes a punch, the tribal governments and recognizing federal laws. So in other words, as any other people, the Aborigines here, the natives, the indigenous people, however you wanna say it, they had their own laws, just like anybody else. They had their own systems and governments, just their, in their ways. It didn't look like suit and ties, George Washington's. It didn't look like Europe. Each culture has its own version of a system that they govern the land by. So the deal was that they abandoned these traditional tribal governments and laws that they have lived by for centuries and to adopt now this new federal law order. That's how you could become one of the civilized tribes. Otherwise, you'd be considered hostile, fought, and killed, and, and then erased out of the census, erased out of the history books. That's why there's only five that everybody knows about. In order to receive this land, <clears throat> the individual tribe member had to apply and then be deemed eligible by the commissioner. So these people, who are not natives, with crooked motives, with Slavery at its peak with corruption that mankind has never seen ever on earth until today, they're going to tell you if you qualify to be considered a tribal Indian. When you, you have to go to them for them to say, okay, we think you're Indian. That's, that, that's, that's ridiculous. So this is what these people had to face, okay? Um, we're getting down to it now. So the commissioner to the five civilized tribes was appointed by President Grover Cleveland in 1893 to negotiate land between Cherokee Creek, Choctaw, Chickasaw, and, Seminole, and the Seminole tribes. It is commonly called the Dawes Commission after its chairman, Henry L. Dawes. Boom. During the early part of the year 1902, the U.S. government reacted with malicious intent in developing a separate freedmen's list specifically designed to root out all copper-colored Indians from receiving their newly established benefits by way of federal government. So in other words, black people want reparations. You're not going to get reparations because you decided to allow yourself to be classified as an African-American. And we're gonna to get to that at the end of the exhibit here on what exactly is an African-American, when the term came, what does it mean? So anybody who is seeking reparations under the term African-American black man will never get it because by law, you're not a citizen, you're property. This was your reparation era. 
Reparations came a long time ago, if you only but knew. It was just called something else, okay? It wasn't called reparations. It was coined with land. It was coined with privileges. It was coined with federal funding. It came in a different form. It didn't just come in a big check. This was your reparations era. But what they did was, like you just said here, they maliciously developed a separate freedmen's list. In other words, when the tribal members would come to sign up and say, I'm from this tribe, I deserve these benefits. They had a back pocket, back door list that the white settlers could come in and sign up and say, I'm Choctaw, I'm Creek. And they would bring the benefits. And all the real Native Americans, Aborigines, who signed the list, that list got thrown in the trash. They got written out of the history books. They got dirt and dust. They inherited nothing. So now we get down to the end. What is also important to note is the US government listed all full-blooded colored aborigines of America, mainly all the aboriginals who had African-like features as black or colored as their classification of race, which was falsely documented inside of the 1900 census. Back to Clip. Paper genocide. At the same time, white U.S. citizens were allowed to become identified as Indians by paying the Dole Commissions a whopping toll of $5. $5 got you a lot back in the day, didn't it? For each white adult and child to be listed on the Dole's roll, it was just $5. Now, here comes the punch. On April 1st, 1902, public notices were passed around detailing that other claimants can legally make their cases for freedmen enrollment, single-handedly allowing all white citizens the rights to legally steal the Indian lands of America, its reparation and optimized benefits set forth by federal law. Ironically, this was officially announced on the day most people tell their very best April Fool's joke, April 1st. So the $5 Indian this was established on April 1st. That's why it's a day to tell jokes because it's a big joke that these people are being classified as Indians. They know it, but it's a joke's on you. So as we come to the end here, uh, here's a picture of some of the Freedmen Rolls, okay? The Creek Nation. This is actual documents here, okay? 1890 is the time frame, okay? Um, commission to the Civilized Tribes. Commission to the Five Civilized Tribes. You have some pictured uh, documents here that you can go off of to add to your research profiles. We have an article here that was in the paper uh, in the 1800s. It says, Indian land for sale. Get a home of your own, easy payments. Protect title, possession within 30 days. Find lands in the West. So they weren't, this wasn't a secret. Once again, why the slaves couldn't read. This is newspaper.